Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this week's meeting of the Hamilton Rotary Club. I'll uh, ask George Johnson to come forward to introduce our guest speaker. There we go. Thank you, Joe. Sure. Uh, before I start, Woody Fitton has asked me to instruct the members how to pronounce what was served today for lunch. It's not gyro, it's gyro. Gyro. Okay, Woody? All right, I am very happy to present today's program. Corbin Moore is the Assistant Program Director for Assessment, Gifted, and ESL, that's English for, as a second language, for the Hamilton City School District. Corbin previously taught middle school, high school, and college level social studies courses and served as the social studies instructional coach and an executive director of several teaching American history grant programs. He received his bachelor's degree in history and secondary social studies education from Thomas More College and his master's in educational leadership from the University of Dayton. In 2012, Corbin was honored with the Jim Blunt History Educator Award by the Michael J. Colligan History Project and Miami University Hamilton. Corbin is the immediate past president of the Ohio Council for Social Studies and has played an active role in advocating and promoting civic literacy and social studies education. With the 75th anniversary of the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor coming up, I thought that this program would be, be very timely. Corbin's going to talk about remembering Pearl Harbor. Thank you for inviting me out today. It's, it's been a while since I've actually had a chance to teach a history lesson, so I'm going to incorporate a little bit of that into today's uh, program. We are going to go over some basic details of what happened at Pearl Harbor, um, talk about things that happened this week. This is a busy week for civic and history education, um, starting off with the anniversary of 9-11. And you'll find, and I'll come back to this towards the end, that the stories between Pearl Harbor and 9-11 are, are fairly similar in a lot of ways. So if you can remember th this day, and one of the reasons I put these photos in here is right now the kids that we have in school, a lot of them were born after 9-11, all right? A lot of the kids were really small. Uh, they don't remember. And these are kids junior high, high school age. So. That's why it's important for us to remember history. I remember as a child, you know, it didn't matter if I was at my grandparents' house or at the barber shop, all, all of my, my, the adults in my life were telling me, you, you have to know your history. And it really stuck with me, and it's become a passion for me throughout my life. So the next slide is, and this was something that happened when I went to the 9-11 memorial, and it was a little firehouse across from where the towers were, and uh, my wife was, a little bit aggravated with me, but my son, because my daughter was born in 2002, and we were there in 2008, had his arm around her and was explaining the events of what happened uh, with the Twin Towers and, and with the planes that, that wrecked in the, that Pennsylvania field and the Pentagon. And I was moved by it, and I didn't take a picture. So I wish I had that picture to share, but I, I wanted to share that memory. And it was a very similar plaque to this one. And like you'll see when we talk about Pearl Harbor, um, the president came out the next day with a very strong statement of what the nation was going to do next. I also wanted to mention this week, at, and it's kind of wrapping up at this point, and actually this morning we had a naturalization uh, ceremony down at the, camp the campus of Miami Hamilton. But this week and every week during between 9-11 and between Constitution Day, uh, the regional campuses of Miami University have citizen and, uh, Citizenship and Democracy Week. And then this Saturday is Constitution Day. For Hamilton City Schools and all the other schools across the country, Constitution Day is tomorrow um, because the kids aren't going to be coming in on Saturday. Let's get into the story of 
Pearl Harbor. Everybody knows the date. Japan attacks Pearl Harbor. More than 2,000 military and civilians are killed. 3,500 casualties, they're about all together. And then the next day on December 8th, the President of the United States asked Congress for a declaration of war. So early in the morning on December 7th, out in the Pacific, about 200 miles away from, from Pearl Harbor and Honolulu, Honolulu the Japanese are preparing their torpedo bombers ready to move in on their multi-phased attack. And this is their goal. Their goal is to fly in and attack the Pacific Fleet, which is stationed at Pearl Harbor. How did they get there? So this is the path, this is a Japanese map that shows the path that the, their destroyers, their aircraft carriers took to get near the Pacific Islands to, to commence the attack. So how did they get there? Complete radio silence. So imagine these ships going across the ocean. How, did they, how were they not detected? It's because they didn't have the radio silence. Would that have happened today? I don't know. I mean, we still have planes that disappear and we can't find them. So nobody really realizes how big the ocean is, but this is how they got across. So here's the phases of the attack. Again, just like September 11th, started real early, blue skies, beautiful day. So the first phase is a combined torpedo plane and dive bomber attacks, and it lasts about a half hour from 7.55 to 8.25. Then there's a lull in the action. Phase three starts with horizontal bomber attacks, and again, this lasts a little bit over a half hour. Then we have dive bomber attacks between 9.15 and 9.45, and by that point, the raid's about over. Everybody knows about well, these particular uh, the planes because they were very visible, but there were other ways that the Japanese um, attacked the ships, and we found out later because one of them was beached, and it was many submarines. There were at least five mini submarines that were part of the battle. So here's shows the first and second wave, how they came in, and I wanted to point out um, that they took out the air support at Wheeler's base and at Hickman's air base. That was part of their strategy and so that the planes couldn't get it up in the air. This is an aerial view of, from one of the Japanese planes, and this is Ford Island, and you can see that this is where Battleship Row was. And the most famous of, out of all of these is the Arizona where the memorial is today. And I'm sure when we get into December time and Fox has their football games that we'll hear more about this and, and uh, in between a little bit of uh, NFL time. So the ones up here in red are all the ships that were sunk. We have several that were heavily damaged, some not damaged at all down in this area, but they, the prize that wasn't there for them this uh, on that morning was the aircraft carriers. They got battleships and destroyers and a lot of uh, the rest of our Pacific fleet, but did not get the aircraft carriers. So here's the Arizona. I wanted to find a color photo of it because the black and white, it's, I, I wanted to see that, that fireball and there it is. This is from the National Archives, um, probably the most famous picture of, of the Arizona. Other ships that were destroyed, these two destroyers, the Downs and the Kassen, were in dry dock. Here it shows the bombing of Wheeler Field. Ford Island, you can see that the hangar has been destroyed and on fire. And I, I put this collage on there because I was just showing a few more of different views of the destruction, but here's that beached submarine because the, the uh, operator uh, had lost control of the steering mechanism and it beached and he ended up being the first POW of the war. The New York Times took up the story the next morning and this is what they had to say. So Japan wars on US and Britain make sudden attack on Hawaii heavy fighting at sea reported. And then it talks about declaration follows air and sea attacks on US and Britain. Uh, and, and Britain. Uh, Roosevelt will address it today and find it ready for a vote of war. 
And I put this piece in. This is the draft that the president wrote from the National Archives uh, of his famous speech, that day in infamy. Um, I actually have a video clip in here, but I think for, for time purposes, this is the speech. Here he is delivering it. I wanted to put it in because if I was in front of a, a group of students, they need to hear that voice. Just like they needed to hear George Bush with the bullhorn. Somebody is telling them, it's like, look, this happened, we got hit, but we're gonna pick ourselves up and move forward. I also wanted to uh, highlight some of the heroes of the day. Lieutenant Samuel uh, Fuqua was on the Arizona, and after a bomb went into the Arizona and ignited all the munitions that they had inside and blew the ship apart, he was a senior officer. All the other officers were killed. And he calmly and collectively, even when having shrapnel wounds, led the uh, escape and the, uh, from the Arizona. Then we have uh, Chief Water Tender Pete Tomich, who was on the Utah, sorry I couldn't fit that in there, but he was on the Utah and his job was to take care of the boilers. And after the ship was hit, he went back into the bowels of the, sh the ship to make sure those boilers didn't go up and, and more, so the men could escape. The, Amer the Army Air Corps pilots, George Welch and Kenneth Taylor, they had a, a fun night the night before. They were at a dance. They actually, when they started here, they heard the bombs and the gunfire. They jumped in their car because they were sleeping off the night before. They put on their tuxedo pants, that's all they had. And they jumped into the planes and they were two of the few planes that actually got into the air. All of these men up here were recognized one way or another. Many of them are congressional uh, honor winners. John Finn was with his wife and near Wheeler Field. Jumped out of bed, went out to Wheeler Field, uh, found a machine gun and kept firing. And he was said in the story that I read about him that he didn't know if he hit many, hit many of the planes, but he sure gave it a good go. And he just kept firing. Um, Doris Miller was a cook on the, you know, the USS West Virginia. And at this time, African Americans weren't allowed to you know, be officers or things like that. He'd never had any formal weapons training. But when it went down, he and his fellow soldiers manned the 50 caliber uh, guns that were on the, on the West Virginia and gave it all they had. And then the last is Lieutenant Phil, uh, Lieutenant Phil Rousman. Um, he was one of the other pilots from the Army Air Corps that got into the air with purple pajamas. <laughs> uh, and that's what he had. Um, again, all of these, these men showed great heroism in the face of great adversity. And you never know what, what any human's going to do until you're there at that moment. And then my personal favorite, and this is from my grandfather. My grandfather uh, is a German immigrant, and so he went to the Pacific, right? They weren't gonna send him to Europe. Um, so he was in the Pacific. He was on one of the transports towards the end of the war before the atomic bomb was dropped. He was gonna be one of the guys that was going to invade Japan. So he thinks Harry S. Truman is just outstanding. Um, <laughs> so for that decision. Um, but right after Pearl Harbor, Jimmy Doolittle and his Doolittle Raiders got together, a bunch of guys, totally volunteer, suicide mission, basically. They took off from an aircraft carrier and B-25s and it was a one-way ticket. And basically they were to bomb a target in Japan and then hopefully make it to China. A lot of them died along the way. And in China, you didn't know if you were gonna make it either because Japan I had occupied a lot of, of China uh, where, uh, where they would possibly wreck or land. So, uh, and this just happened a few years ago, but up at the United States, United States Air Force Museum, which is I argue the best museum in, in Ohio. Um, they have the bottle of cognac, and it's been opened now, but all the goblets of all the surviving Doolittle Raiders, and when they were down to three, these three gentlemen uh, opened it up and toasted to all the, all the Doolittle, Doolittle Raiders that came before them. 
just like 9-11, here's some examples of remember December 7th. Before that, it was remember the main. Now it's always remember what happened with our Twin Towers. Uh, hopefully, some of our band members, when they go out this fall, um, will get a chance to visit from Hamilton High, I'm talking about in the marching band, uh, get to visit the, United, the USS Arizona Memorial. And at this point, I want to show you what we do in Hamilton High. It might be a little bit different. We're, I gave you basically some background knowledge, a little bit of the story that you know. Well, at Hamilton High, for probably about the past 10 years, maybe eight to 10 years, we've been using documents-based questions. And documents-based questions are what advanced placement kids use uh, to pass the US history test for advanced placement. They get college credit for that. But we've expanded that so that all kids have access to this, and we adjust the documents as it goes. So it starts out with a simple question. Why did Japan attack Pearl Harbor? So we start off with a background essay. And in this background essay, it's going to talk about, it has a map, it shows Japan, and it shows Manchuria, where they had set up a puppet government. Um, it shows the east coast of China. That was their goal uh, to take over and, and basically spread their influence. It also gets into the League of Nations. Well, the United States, even though our president was the one that pushed for the League of Nations, the US, citizen, the US Senate never ratified it. So Japan joined the League of Nations, and they had a bad taste in their mouth about that particular experience. And to go back a few years earlier, we had examples of Japanese relations where we had Commodore Perry go into Tokyo's harbor and say basically, hey, trade with us, or we're going to start firing and burn down the town. So we started that way in the 1870s. Then Teddy Roosevelt, another one of my historical uh, heroes, he actually negotiates the peace between Russia and Japan in 1905. And the cherry trees that everybody goes to see in Washington, D.C. are kind of a result of, of, of that time as a thank you. So we start off with this background essay, reasonable, not a whole chapter, but definitely something reasonable that we can break down and ask questions about. And then we have a hook activity, something that may be a little controversial, something to get you to think about it. But this is based on, in 1924, the United States should be an S there, but point out my own mistakes, right? The United States Congress passed the Immigration Quota Act. And what it basically said, it limited immigrants from Eastern and Southern Europe, but it denied immigration for Indians, and I'm talking people from India, Indians, uh, Chinese and Japanese folks. And this is an example, it's a quote from, a, obviously translated from a Japanese uh, newspaper. And a lot of the people in Japan saw that as a declaration of war. Then we have, get into our documents. The first document is talking about the New World Order. And I'm not gonna read through each one of these, but this particular, la the last po point here, it says the way of the subject is to be loyal to the emperor in disregard of self. And I know I've talked to a lot of World War II vets and everybody knew at that time that the Japanese were gonna to fight to the end. And that's because their loyalty to the emperor, to their country was greater than their self. So that's what we were facing with the invasion of Japan. And this was part of their high school experience. This was required reading. Second document. And again, I would spend, the kids would have a couple of days to go through these. So this is going fairly fast for you. All right, so between 1870 and 1945, Japan starts out here. They take over Manchuria. Uh, they put the former uh, emperor of China, Pu Yi, and I know this because I was that kid in the 1980s that watched The Son of Heaven, uh, but three hour movie, right? All right, so he takes over Manchuria, then they start bombing, and then there's the rape of Nanking. And their goal is to get to these oil fields down here, which are controlled by the Netherlands and the French. So a bit of a battle there. And the Japanese, they want to be an imperial power. They want to be an industrial power. They have the industry piece. They don't have the natural resources. So we get into the next document. It's a timeline, and it shows what I've been talking about. 
Japan occupies Manchuria, Japan attacks China. When we wake our way down, this is an important one. The U.S. begins an embargo of aircraft and aircraft parts. President Roosevelt moves the U.S. Pacific Fleet from California to the Pearl Harbor. Check that out on the website. I know you can see a lot of the conspiracy theory things about that. I always go on what the evidence tells me. And I always tell the kids that. You guys are attorneys. You're lawyers. You have to see what the evidence is telling you and plead your case. Then we get down to the U.S. Congress passes Naval Expansion Act. This is going to make the Japanese think. If they're going to expand their military and their naval power by 1944, maybe we should act now. We get down to the United States freezes all Japanese assets. The United States imposes an embargo on oil, and this is really the big one. And then the Japanese attack Pearl Harbor. So let's look at those imports. This is our, we have two more documents, I promise. I won't keep you here all day. Uh, so the Japanese imports between 1937 and 1941, petroleum, this is the big one. If you look, in 1937, 380 compared to 482, and we're talking 10 thousands of tons, 80% of the oil that Japan had came from the United States. And then if you go down to 1941, it drops off significantly and eventually gets down to zero because we have an embargo against them. Same thing happens with steel and scrap iron. So what this is doing is helping the kids get that evidence so when they write their paper, they have their discussions, now they have something to go back to. This is comments from Hideki Tojo, who was the prime minister of, of Japan. And he gave this talk at an imperial conference on November 5th, 1941. Just highlighting some things here. This, these first two sentences. What they insist upon is Japan's acceptance of the principle of the withdrawal of troops. I understand it. Withdrawal of the troops, uh, withdrawal of our troops is retreat. It's dishonor. We're not going to do that. Skipping down to here, it talks about how the United States does what it pleases. It's telling the, us what to do. And I fear if we let this happen, down at the very bottom, we'll become a third class nation. And they don't want that at all. So what do we tell the kids to do with it? Well, with my ESL kids, with all the other kids that I, I work with here in Hamilton, we do a practice called bucketing. I remember as a kid watching WGN and Bozo the Clown, right, and throwing balls in the bucket. I don't know why this works, but kids understand that if I look at these documents, I can drop them in the buckets. It just, it seems to be magic with them. I don't know why it works, but it's a simple process that they understand. And it sets up what they're going to write about. And I apologize, it's when I transferred this from what I, Google into uh, PowerPoint, it kind of moved these things. But here's their paragraphs. They have plan for a new world order. A, B, and C talk about that. So now I have some things that I can quote for that particular paragraph. US fleet expansion, C and D, those two documents, now I have documentation for my next point. And my last one is the US oil embargo, and that applies to C and E. So in those paragraphs that they're writing, you'll see documentation. And before I get to that, all of this is done through a discussion. This is another thing that I've, I've been telling teachers across our district, the importance of speaking and listening skills. You ask employers what they want. They want people that can work together and people that have strong speaking and listening skills. So why not help them out a little bit? Instead of talking about, we're going to write an argument essay, and what they might be thinking is maybe a version of Judge Judy or uh, the Jerry Springer show, that type of argument, right? How do you? How do you disagree civilly? How do you have an argument? How do you disagree with folks? How do you affirm? How do you predict? How do you offer a suggestion? We give them those sentence stems, and they call on one another by name, talking about the documents that we had and we just bucketed. And because the ultimate goal is for them to give us a thesis, write down their claims, provide all the evidence from the documents, and end up with a well-written essay that they can use to whatever they decide to do in their lives. This is helping them organize their thoughts. This is real life. This is getting on the internet. And like I said earlier, you can go on the internet and find a lot of things. And everything's right, true on the internet, right? So, <laughs> so this is sim a simulation of that. If I have a problem, I go, can go out and find it on the internet. But I have to look at what's reliable. Where's the bias? Who's credible? 
This is real life things that they'll have to do for a job or for college. So I wanted to wrap up and congratulate the Hamilton High School uh, marching band who has a great opportunity to go out to Hawaii this November. And so I say it correctly, it's a Waikiki Holiday Starlight Parade. So they're gonna take part in that, they're gonna be there about a week, I imagine a lot of that's travel time, um, but we're very proud of our Hamilton High marching band and I thank you today for letting me tell you a little bit about Pearl Harbor so we can remember the past and about the good things that we're doing in our history and social studies classes to improve historical knowledge and civic engagement. Thank you. Thank you again, Corbin. He'll be here uh, afterwards uh, if you have other questions or comments for him. Uh, very interesting presentation this morning. We thank you for being here and, and uh, how and, and what high schools are doing, high schoolers, as far as research and getting to an essay. A lot different from when I was there. Meeting adjourned. We'll see you next week in the evening. Thank you for coming. And go serve you men.